I want to finish chapter 12 by talking about some mo more modern implementations of reduced order models. Uh, so this is out of the book, Data Driven Science and Engineering, Brent and Kutz. Here's the website. And what I want to talk about specifically is to think about in the model reduction we've done so far, what we've been thinking a lot about is doing a reduction, taking some PDE, looking at the low dimensional subspace, building a model there. But a lot of PDEs have parametric dependencies. In other words, there's some parameters that are varying. And so when you build that subspace, the subspace itself has to be changed. So you have to keep switching reduced order model. You have to keep rebuilding them. So part of what I want to talk about now is using some more ideas that are common to machine learning towards this reduced order modeling infrastructure. Okay, so uh, that's what we want to go after, and we want to think really in context of parametric partial differential equations. In other words, a PDE that has this nice evolution, but there's a parameter there. So your subspace that works over here does not work over here, doesn't work over here, but each one has its own subspace. So what do you do with that? It's not like, do you just keep rebuilding models, or is there a way to more effectively use machine learning to do this? All right, remember that the architecture is here. So we have some PDE that we discretize to generate some high dimensional ODE system. Linear part, nonlinear part. And really what we should think about now is that there's some parameter dependence here. Like there's some parameter beta that everything depends upon. And as beta changes, this is what's problematic. As beta changes, the slow dimensional subspace we build here by taking SVD of the data is different for all the different beta regimes that we might have. So as I change parameter space, the subspace that I've built here no longer works in another regime. And that is pretty common. And also highlights all the dangers of machine learning type architectures. Wherever you trained a model, that's where it works. The minute you walk out of that space, it's it's not clear your model will work anymore. So right, you're going to start trying to extrapolate into a new space. Interpolation works great. Interpolation is so much easier than extrapolation. I just can't emphasize that enough. So the minute you extrapolate is a minute that you're probably going to have mathematical challenges at that point, and your, your model is going to break down. Okay, and that's actually how you know when things don't work. That's why you're trying to extrapolate. And if things work amazingly well, you're probably interpolating. Okay, I'm almost, I put money down on it. Okay, but this is the idea that this basis set I have to have is, is problematic. I have to keep changing it. And I can still do the reduction like this. And now we've learned that I can reduce and I know how to compute this effectively in some interpolation space. This is what we've been spending most of chapter 12 talking about. How do we do this interpolation nicely? Uh, but then if I have to change subspaces, then I have to keep redoing this process of learning a new basis relearning a new uh, sparse sampling alg structure for that basis, okay? So how are we going to capitalize on that? Remember, that's part of our problem now, but part of our problem now is these have parametric dependencies maybe, or could also come into a linear term, but let's just, you know, in general, they have parametric dependency in this. So what I want to start talking about is this concept that really comes out of machine learning, which is, hey, well, let's build libraries of uh, modes. So this is sort of this construct that we might have. So suppose that PDE, let me go back to it. Suppose there's some variability, suppose that this thing depends on some parameter mu. Suppose that mu in fact is either a bifurcation parameter, it doesn't even have to even bifurcate, it's just a parameterization of this problem where as mu changes, your subspace changes. So what we want to do is capitalize on that and say, well, that's fine. Suppose I take some snapshots for some given mu, and I find a load dimensional embedding. So now that I find some POD modes, what I want to do with that is then take those POD modes, remember it's a small number of columns, an R rank approximation of the data, and I'm going to put this in a library. In other words, I'm going to keep that subspace over in a library, and if I find a new simulation with some different mu, and I find some different modes that are like, oh, over here, here is the subspace that seems to represent this parameter regime. Now take that subspace, put it in my library. And when I go over here, here's a different subspace that represents my dynamics. So take 
that subspace, put it in my library. So the library is going to contain collections of subspaces. Now, a couple things to note. Each subspace, right, that I pull out, these modes are orthonormal. So they're orthogonal to each other and with unit length. But when I pull out another set of modes, the two sets of library modes are not orth they're orth orthonormal with within their group, not across their groups. Just keep that in mind. Okay, so I'm just going to build up a collection. So it could be that, in fact, you have the ability to initially do some high-end simulations in different parameter regimes you know that matter. And for each one of those regimes, you say, okay, in each regime, I will pull out the dominant POD modes that are there, r rank truncations that work in each one, and I'll put those all into a library. Okay, because normally what happens with parametric variability is the parameter might be wandering around in time. So, you know, it starts here in this domain and wanders to this domain and then later on it wanders to this domain. And so part of what you could imagine doing is if I have this library structure, I'd say, well, while I'm here, I use the modes that I learned from here. When I get over to here, I use those modes. And when I get over to here, I use these modes. So the idea is to recycle what you've done. And if you've already learned these modes and you've already learned how to interpolate the nonlinearity, don't redo that work. You already have it. Build a library, learn how to use it there. So this is what we want to do. This is sort of using this idea of, of, of sparse sampling again and how to do this. And really what we want to do is not only learn how to reuse those modes, but remember we've been spending a lot of time talking about interpolation. And from a small number of points, I guess one of the questions you could ask is not only could I reconstruct but what I'd like, really like to do is pick a small number of points that allow me to reconstruct, but also work in these different regimes. And maybe even allow me the idea of being able to take those small number of measurements and classify which regime I'm in in the first place. So in other words, if I take our measurements, could I tell which library I should be using? And then do, a, do my sparse approximation in that library. So we're going to start changing this idea of the interpolation points we're using for dime or q dime or im or gappy methods in general. And we're going to not only we're not going to just say you're only being used for interpolation. We're also going to say that these measurement points or interpolation points are also going to be used for doing a classification task to tell me which library elements should I be using in the first place. Because I have a library of a bunch of different possibilities, which ones do I go after? So again, accurate reconstruction is what we want. And here's what we want to do now. This is going to be how we think about uh, our reconstruction measurements. Notice how we're going to change this approximation. So before, when we did this approximation, we only had one set of modes. Now. I have a whole library. So I, in other words, my solution now, I'm going to say my U state space is going to be approximated, projected into my library modes. There's my projection, there's U tilde. So this is interesting architecture, right? Because now uh, it's not just project into this set of modes, it's project into a library. And by the way, I don't want to use all the library. I only want to use the grouping I need. And so the idea is to use sparsity promotion techniques versus well, the way we've done it before is just simply L2, you know, least squares. Now I want to start saying, let's start using some of our sparse optimization tools available to us. And what I want to start doing is start actually using something like equivalent a little bit to an L1 norm to sparsely select the smallest number of modes I need to approximate my solution. Because remember, I have bought a lot of modes in that library, and I want to just take out the collection that matters. I want every, all other coefficients to be zero. Okay, so once I build the library, I want to classify which one of the modes matter, then reconstruct in those modes. That's another way to say it. And I'm going to start using L1 optimization to do this, to classify this. So how do we do it? Well, so here's how you might do it. I have the solution, I have some data, 
And what I want to do really is to say, okay, when I do this regression and I promote sparsity, that in fact what it finds is, oh, you know, for the data you have in the projection matrix, this, again, this is a, we'll talk about this P matrix a little bit more, that in fact the L1 optimization promotes sparsity, it tries to make most of it zero, and it says, oh, for the data you have in the regime you're in, here are the non-zero elements. I try to make everybody zero, but these are the non-zero, and it, look, it highlights some library modes. In fact, usually it's gonna highlight a group of modes that come out of it, which says, oh, these modes matter, everybody else is zero. So pull those out. And then now I can do the reconstruction in those modes. So I keep this library, which is over complete. There's a lot of modes in there. And the sparsity promotion says, let me, which one of these best fit the data? Now, if you're in a specific regime, if you're in this regime, you already know that those modes sit in there. So when you do the sparse regression, it should say, ah, you guys don't matter. These are the smallest number of modes I can use to do a great job. Everybody else should go to zero. And that's exactly what this sort of shows you. So it does a classification task, right, by identifying which grouping of modes it should be using and then reconstructing in those modes. So this is a great way to use this because now what's allowing you to do is to say, I can now do parametric PDEs by solving all over these regimes. And then the thing that this will do is it will go figure out which regime I'm in, pull the modes from there, do reconstruction. And I can keep all the modes jointly together into this library. All right, so let me give you an example of this. And so the example I'm going to give you is flow around a cylinder. So, you know, you could solve these equations with some cylinder uh, inside of the fluid flow itself, and you flow, you know, you have your flow field go past this, and this is a classic problem. And I want to just show you what this looks like. In particular, this is showing you uh, four different configurations or parametric configurations. This is Reynolds number 40, Reynolds number 150, 300, and 1000. So what I've shown you on the top is the pressure field around the cylinder as a function of time. So when you're at Reynolds number 40, notice that the pressure field just looks, there's nothing going on. And then you get the bifurcation, you get these oscillations of the pressure field around the cylinder, and then they change a little bit in structure, specifically the frequency and shape a bit. And so those are the dynamics from the full simulation. And what I've done here in these pictures is plotted for you the POD modes on a circular basis. So there's the cylinder in the middle. And the POD modes, mode one is yellow, mode two is the magenta, mode three is the cyan. So those are the dominant three modes for Reynolds number 40, 150, 300 and 1,000. The most important thing you see is that the dynamics is very low rank, but the modes are changing significantly from Reynolds number 40 to 1,000. In other words, look at the Reynolds number 1,000 mode. Look at its structure compared to, here's Reynolds 150 or 40. So the point about this is it would be very hard to represent the dynamics of Reynolds number 1,000 using the Reynolds 40 modes and vice versa. But I can collect these modes and put them all into a library and say, here's my Reynolds number 40 modes, my number, Reynolds number 150 modes, all the way up to Reynolds number 1000. And I have these in my library. And so now I can look at the, my, I look at the and sparse number of measurements. In other words, my interpolation points. Here's, here's more of the picture of it. So now I look at my points, let's say, selected by dime or I'm or, or random, whatever I want to do. I take pressure measurements around the cylinder. And the first thing I do is I do the classification task. I say, if I see this, what I want to do is do a classification task. And what I want to look at is say, which, which Reynolds number is it? So I'm going to use these measurements, first of all, with this L1 parallelization to classify and tell me from the measurements, which modes should I be using? Which groups of modes? So I classify the Reynolds number. So you might find, oh, for the flow field you currently have, it thinks you're at Reynolds number 300. Okay, so now that you're at 300, you select those modes out, and now you can do a reconstruction like you normally would, and now you're using those modes, and you're using the sparse sensor locations, 
for in the standard way of I'm dime or Q dime. And so here, for instance, is the flow field, uh, the true flow field, the reconstructed flow field using a small number of sensors with this library type structure around the cylinder. So it's kind of a nice way to think about using and combining machine learning architectures. And you can even have something like this. This is some work with Ido Bright and Guang Lin, uh, two couple papers from 2013 to 16. Uh, as you change the Reynolds number of the flow field, um, you, have the, you have your interpolation points, which are like sensor points now, first doing a classification task. So the first thing that happens is as the Reynolds number changes, this, so what I'm showing is it first ramps up and the yellow dots are the classification, what it thought the Reynolds number was. And you can see it can make mistakes right around transition points for the flow start. You, you really nail the, 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 the Reynolds number so it classifies correctly and then you can reconstruct in these different domains. So as your system's Reynolds number is changing, you are changing out library terms and changing out your reduced order model effectively. And so the interpolation points are not only acting as sensors to classify the right dynamics, but are acting as sensors to interpolate correctly the nonlinearity as well. So those are some just ideas. Uh, a lot of people are starting to work in this area. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big growth area to have machine learning architectures with reduced order models. I've just highlighted very simple ideas in this last section um, where you can exploit these kind of structures and libraries to build much more, uh, uh, to enrich what you can do with reduced order modeling. Uh, everything can be found here, databookuw.com, and the PDF is there, all the codes, everything I've done for chapter 12 is in there. And so chapter 11 and 12 together will hopefully help you learn quite a bit about how to do reduced order modeling and how to implement it in practice.